St. Pete Beach got the Traveler's Choice Award from TripAdvisor, the best beach in the USA and number five in the world. It is very close knit. Yeah, it's almost like a family. A little bit of uh, dolphin watching tours, sunset tours, and we are also the sunset capital of Florida. And we can have as many as I've heard 30,000 tourists. Fishing is where it's at for me. It's in my blood. I can't get away from it. My name is Kyle Applefield. I'm a third generation local fishing captain. My earliest memories around here on the water, growing up fishing with my dad, enjoying the boat, just enjoying our environment and everything it has to offer. Get a job making five times what I make and having to be on land, my wife says it the best. I don't want to deal with your miserable behind coming home from work every day. Just, just keep fishing, so it makes me happy. Kyle I met a couple of years ago. We went out on the boat. My son said, hey, if we ever go fishing again, we're going Captain Kyle. He has an unbelievable reputation around here. Just a great guy. I grew up running up and down the east coast of Florida, surfing, fishing, always on the water. This is uh, my guys, this is my son and my daughter. The beach is where we live, that's where we spend all of our time. You know, that's what you do. That's what you do when you're here, you're on the water. Some people say, how big is your backyard? And we say, well, it's as big as the Gulf of Mexico, so that's our backyard. Fish kill after fish kill as red tide wreaks havoc on the beaches of southwest Florida, wrecking the scenery, killing the wildlife, causing an overwhelming smell, and hurting businesses along the coast. If you would have seen red tides down here, I mean, it just, it boggles the mind. Just tons and tons and tons, literally, of dead fish, you know, a bulldozer pushing them down the beach. It breaks your heart. It was amazing how many fish were pulled out of the Tampa Bay area that were dead from red tide. Over millions of pounds of fish, or something, a million and a half pounds or something, they, they, they estimated something crazy like that. I was here for the last red tide. It wasn't fun. I live a few blocks from the water, and it's the respiratory issues that it causes that are, you know, the real pro or a problem, lots of problems. The red tide affects us in terms of tourism. Red tide, of course, reduces the number of people coming to the beach. They don't come, and, and, our, and our businesses suffer from it. Yeah, it was desolate. I mean, you know, you couldn't be out. You know, you could not be out. Red tide affects my business tremendously. It shuts us down. Us fishermen, we can't afford, we can't afford any downtime. We gotta work. Every few years seems like we get a pretty serious red tide. Uh, once every three years, maybe. Red tide is chemically, it is caused by an algae called K. brevis that uh, cuts off the oxygen supply to fish. This microorganism can feed off the nutrients and fertilizer that can seep from farms or lawns into the water. Red tide still affects us three years later and I don't wanna see another one. Our products make fertilizer more efficient. They make nitrogen and phosphate more efficient. These are bad chemicals, bad for the environment. They feed algae blooms and red tides and they cause all kinds of problems. These things should be used to feed a plant. When I came in contact with EcoWorld, where they were working on additives to fertilizers, I wasn't real excited when they said, hey, you want to work with us on this? But the more they talked, the more I realized that this was a way to be impactful. The population of the world is growing, and it's growing almost exponentially. The demands on our abilities to grow food is also 
expanding. You can throw fertilizer on the ground and just keep throwing it, but it gets into the waterways, it gets into the atmosphere, it's pollution. So if you're trying to feed a growing population in the world, you gotta do that without destroying the environment. I saw this as being something that was, for me, important. And I poured myself into this particular area. So what we have here is our product uncolored. We actually put whatever color you want on it and it coats these urea prills. Nitrogen in the form of urea, which uh, our product stops it from uh, going off into the environment and lets the plant have time to grab it and grow. So this is an example of a urea prill that's been coated right there. It's as simple as doing it in a concrete mixer. You just tumble it and voila, coated urea that can uh, stop nitrate leaching. This one, at a higher viscosity, but an acceptable viscosity. We, we talked about various formulations and we came up with, uh, Ray actually mentioned that, why don't we try dimethyl sulfoxide? Dimethyl sulfoxide uh, is used for joints, for pain in joints, especially horses. Uh, race horses use it uh, on their legs. Ray actually had a little at his house, so he tried to use that. It was effective. So I took it from there and formulated a product that seemed to work very well. We noticed that dimethyl sulfoxide had several advantages over the current products in the marketplace. And one of those was that it was very quickly coating the fertilizer, much faster than any other product in the marketplace. And uh, these things work really well. I mean, you can increase the yields per acre. 20, 30 percent. So it's a vital piece of technology. During all this process of creating this formulation, we wanted to protect our technology. So early in 2012, when we started working on this, I started working on writing a patent to patent our formulation. And eventually, we got a patent for our product, which took several years. It's a normal process. It takes four or five years sometimes to get a patent. We worked around our formulations and made sure we didn't infringe on anything that was in the marketplace at that time. So when you go through the patent prosecution process, you go through about a three to five year period where someone who is very, very familiar with the art, called an examiner, will review and challenge you. And about 52% of the applications over time end up becoming patents. Right now we have about 16 U.S. patents. Internationally we have another 15 or 16. Probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 million dollars uh, getting these patents. Our product actually outperformed our competitors. And as we started taking market share, then we, we started uh, creating a kind of a, I guess it was a, a negative pushback. These big corporations, it's a very disruptive technology to them. So when they make this nitrogen in the form of urea, put it on the ground on the farms, when it rains and it leaches down and gets into the groundwater and this nitrogen washes off into the Gulf of Mexico, they love that. They love that because guess what? They get to sell it again. Our technology is disruptive. They're used to a flow of their technology in incremental steps. When you throw something at them that is a major step, it impacts their bottom line. They either want to grab that from you or they want to drive you out of the marketplace to where they can control it. We actually came into view of a particular multinational company. We ended up with uh, something called a PGR, post-grant review. What the heck is that? You get your patent, you think, I'm whole now, I'm good. And all of a sudden you get this thing called a PGR and you go, what in the world can that be? Somebody has filed a petition to the U.S. Patent Board saying that our patents are valid. They were found valid, right? It's not like a jury. 
It's not like a, a, a anything, any court action I was ever familiar with. It's uh, completely different. The America Invents Act of uh, 2013 was passed. In my opinion, it was either had unintended consequences or it was a hoodwink of America. Because it's so under the radar that people don't understand. You say PTAB and they're like, what's PTAB? What's the Patent Trials and Appeals Board? Well, what is that? And when you get down to it, it's three failed lawyers who got a job and get incentivized to invalidate patents. This is not an impartial uh, board. They're very partial. They gave all the credence to the expert witness on the other side, and he didn't know whether a fluidized urea bed was a liquid or a dry. Literally, it's in the record. He didn't know if it was liquid or dry, and the board gave them all the credibility in the world. We take it because of this expert witness. We, we take their word for it and ran with it. It's already been through an examiner who is just incredibly grueling. And who do they throw under the bus? Their own examiners. Well, he didn't think about it this way. He didn't look at it in the way we're looking at it. But they never ask him the question. They never bring him into the, into the discussion. Why do we have a patent prosecution that results in 52% of patents getting approved and getting, you know, becoming a patent, an application becoming a patent, and then 84% of those are wrong? Are those examiners that, that stupid? You know, it was sold to the American public as keeping patent trolls out of the way, and it's not that. It's a tool to allow big corporations to steal your technology, plain and simple. So the ground rules went from A to B. How can you fight uh, the umpire and the opposing team both? It was just, it, it just stunned us. And lo and behold, while we were fighting this, the same company comes back with another post-grant review type thing. This was a, what they call an IPR. Never heard of it. And so we've been fighting that. And they try to, to basically bankrupt you by taking you through the PTAB process with patent reviews. And if those don't turn out, then federal court actions which gets into millions and millions of dollars worth of cost to defend yourself. And all of a sudden, instead of being able to make things better, to improve things, now I'm having to start to learn how to go through a patent board review. It takes away from the next problem you're going to solve because you're in courts, or you're talking to lawyers, or you're doing research or studies for your case. The way that the American Invents Act has been put together, it's killing invention. Me personally, I wake up and get ready to go fishing and if there's red tide in the area and I can't get around it or through it, that's the extent of it. And there's red tide, you're just kind of screwed. If I can't go out in the water and fish, it means I have no income, I can't work. Bills don't get paid, all the times we're not able to work or the fish aren't there because there's just red tide. If there's red tide in the area, you can't fish. So, you know, eliminating that would uh, just, that'd, that'd be great. That would, that would lessen our downtime when that red tide's around. If someone were to come down here for their first time to the area and there was a really bad red tide at that time, I think they wouldn't be too prone to come back here if they had any other choices, you know. Which kills us because I rely solely on, you know, repeat clients and stuff. I stopped advertising. I rely on my people to come back in town year after year. Not to mention them coming in town, boosting the restaurants and stuff all helps the seafood industry. So that affects us as the commercial fishermen as well. We do this because we believe in the product. It makes the world better. I mean, this makes the world better. It's personal for us. We want other people to reap the benefits of this as much as we do. And we can't do it because other people want to steal it. They were infringing. They wanted to spend us out of, out of existence.
why would I become a chemist? Well, actually, I was a chemist at five years old. I'd get under my mom's sink, and I would look at there, and I would see all these things, and I would think, what would happen if I mix these things together? I just couldn't imagine doing anything else. I was born to do this. This, this to me, is, is what uh, I was meant to do. We're driven to improve the world, to put things in the marketplace that are better than anybody else has got. And then we're crushed. Companies have become quite aggressive in either just running with your technology and daring you to go to court. And when you start to litigate or you start to push, then they start to use other means to bring you to your knees. It is the most unfair, most un-American thing that I, I, I could ever imagine. 2013 is when we filed our first application, so eight years, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten million dollars uh, getting these patents. I would say all of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight here at about five dollars a piece for the frame, they're worth eh, 40 bucks. Frame value. They're worth the frame, whatever the cheap frame is. They're not worth anything. I mean, uh, the patent office made sure of that. Over the course of my career, I think patents have always been like the Cadillac. That, that's where you can mostly protect yourself from anybody, which isn't the case. I mean, because obviously people can challenge it and they can bankrupt you if they want to, if they have the funds to do it by challenging you. Even if you win the first round, still could take you to court and, and appeal it and challenge it. So it puts, uh, the small company and the little guy in a very precarious, difficult situation. What's made America great is the small guys, the disruptors. That's what we are. We're here to make it better. And so we're going to fight. We do all that we can. We'll fight it. I'll fight it with my last breath. The point of all of this and, and spending so much time in this and you know being so stubborn through this whole process is that I believe people will wake up and it'll change, you know? But uh, it's gotta change knowing that this is not, our story is not an outlier. Ours is just an example. We're talking about red tides. That's our invention. That's our disruptive technology, our thought process. There's millions and millions of people out there who are going through the same thing. You know, things have to change, people have to wake up, you have to have politicians who actually care, who will take this under their wing. We want to spend time with our family, we want to walk on the beach, that's enjoyable to us. That's why we do this. I love this area, good people, that you want to take care of. You want to take care of these people. You want to take care of their beaches. I would hope for my son to be able to enjoy our area and our ecosystem and our environment the way I've been able to. If you're out on the boat, you're having fun in the water fishing and stuff, there's really no better place to be. I wouldn't trade it for anything growing up. And I hope that, you know, my son and all his buddies and that whole generation uh, get to enjoy the same things I was able to enjoy. I'm proud to be part of this. I'm proud to have worked on things that has an impact on the world. And even in the throes of all the things we've been through, research doesn't stop, fellas. It just doesn't. I'm, I'm going to continue to do. I'm going to continue to fight, just like my partners are. We're going to make things better for the farmers, for the growers, and for the people of the world. What more could you ask for?